All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are live with the Chamber of Commerce webinar, Communicate to Connect. My name's Patty Dow and I'm the member services uh, specialist and I'm the newest member of the chamber team. I joined the chamber January 4th. So I am starting the new year out with a bang. Um, with many of us at home today, all of us living in reduced in-person social and professional circles, it's really, really important that we still stay connected. Uh, we're depending on virtual meetings, emails, social media, LinkedIn messages to express ourselves and connect with all of our audiences. So today we have Dr. Henwood, who's gonna walk us through how we build relationships through the power of writing. Thanks to everyone who has submitted questions for us. And I, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And feel free to actually add more questions in the chat box on the bottom of your screen. Dr. Henwood is the author of Business Writing for Innovators and Change Makers, and also another book called A Writing Guide for IT Professionals. She specializes in helping businesses communicate the value of complex solutions in a clear and simple writing that resonates with the target audience and makes great things happen. For over her 20 year career, Dawn has worked as a professor, a corporate trainer, an instructional designer with clients ranging from startups to government agencies and multinational firms. We are very excited to have Dr. Henwood with us this morning, and we thank you for joining us. Dr. Henwood. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Every time I do a webinar like this, I feel like I come away having learned something. So I'm looking forward to interacting with you through the chat and hearing some of those questions. I will be keeping my eye on the chat box as we go. So please don't feel like you have to wait to the end of the session to ask something. And uh, you'll actually want also to keep your eye on the chat. Uh, I'm going to be asking you some questions and inviting you to respond via that window. So you'll want to see what other folks are saying through the chat window. Okay, well, here we are on Zoom. Uh, many of you uh, may have already had a couple of Zoom calls today. Uh, first question I'd like to ask you via the chat uh, really quickly is if you have your choice, which do you prefer, Zoom or phone call? Zoom or phone call. So just write Zoom or phone. So we've already got three for Zoom already. Zoom is in the lead. Allison says phone. Amy says that depends. Okay, great. But it's interesting how many people are saying Zoom, even though we're all hearing these days about Zoom fatigue. Well, one of the reasons that we prefer Zoom, of course, is because we can see things like body language. We can also uh, sometimes see kind of, you know, the, the context the person is in, right? It's kind of interesting to see different uh, people's offices. I, I remember meeting with one fellow who was having his home office in his woodshed and he had a kayak above him and a, and a banjo in the background. So you know, it's, it's really interesting to see how much extra information we can get via Zoom versus the phone. Now, communications researchers have a way of talking about this difference. They say that there are thicker and thinner channels or means of communication. So Zoom would be a thicker um, channel because if you kind of use the bandwidth analogy, you know, there are more opportunities, more kinds of nonverbal uh, cues that we can get that help us understand somebody's message. Now, here's my beef. Writing gets a really bad rap because writing is accused of being one of the, the thinnest, maybe the thinnest, channels of business communication. Um, because of course, someone sends an email or a report, we don't get the facial gestures, the tone of voice, and so on. Now, 
that's why people also say that, you know, writing can be hard to interpret and sometimes we even need to walk through a document with somebody to make sure they don't misunderstand it. Well, in my experience over the past 20 years as a writing trainer and coach, I would say that the, the number one reason that uh, people have this kind of negative feeling about the capacity of writing to convey their meaning is that they really misunderstand what the basic purpose of most business writing is. The purpose of most business writing is not simply to deliver information or inform or even close the sale. I'd say it's really to engage the reader in a conversation. And often that conversation is ongoing. So it's a conversation that happens both on the page or on the screen or on the, on the device. Uh, and it also happens, happens off the page, so to speak. So this morning in our short time together, we're going to explore some of the ways that you can thicken up your writing so that it conveys more of your personality, more of your meaning, and helps you really connect with the people you're trying to communicate with so that you can use it to not just impart information, but really build relationships. Uh, let me tell you, if all business communication was about was imparting information, I would not have spent the past 20 years learning as much as I can about it. To me, it is about building relationships and that's what makes it endlessly interesting. So our conversation today, will look briefly at four topics. We're going to talk about making the mental shift from explaining to engaging. Uh, then we're going to look at how you connect with the target audience using language that resonates with them. We're gonna talk about how you build trust one writing goal at a time. And finally, how you craft a prospecting email to set up a conversation. So I'm actually going to give you a little model you can use to create uh, the kind of message that will get you uh, what we call a discovery call. I'm not sure what you call it in your world, but you know that initial conversation that you wanna have with somebody just really to get to know them better and figure out if there's a way you can collaborate or maybe a way that you can serve this person through your business. All right, so make the mental shift from explaining, elaborating about how something works, imparting information to engaging. Well, what do we mean by engagement? I think looking at this picture should help us. When you look at this picture of a live audience listening to somebody, what signs of engagement do you see? And here you can use the chat just to let me know what you observe, what you notice about this audience. How can you tell that they're engaged? So thanks, Bonnie. Bonnie says leaning forward, eye contact, right? We can see they're looking straight ahead. They're looking at the speaker. Some of them have open body language. Um, some of them actually have closed body language. You know, if you look at this fellow like this, uh, but that seems to be a pensive pose rather than a distracted pose or a defensive pose. And we often talk about like touching your neck or touching your nose is kind of a, a defensive uh, move, right? So we see thinking, we see engagement. Well, uh, when I think about engagement, I think about it very much kind of from my background as an educator and a trainer and you know in the in the classroom context when we talk about engagement some synonym, synonyms that we would use would be enthusiastic, committed, actively involved. Uh, you think about also employee engagement, that's another context where we use that word. Again, people uh, who uh, demonstrate high employee engagement are willing to go above and beyond because they are so excited about their work, they're so committed to it, they're emotionally invested. The main thing to note here is that engaged is not a synonym for just showing up, right? It's not a synonym for some kind of like passive um, or, or, you know, kind of non-emotional, impersonal exchange. Okay, so how do you get your audience to lean into you when you're writing and you don't have the ability to, you know, make your voice suddenly louder or softer or use hand gestures or any of those things? Well, you need to lean into them. 
How do you do that? Two questions. You want to focus on, you want to find out, first of all, what does your audience care about? And second, what do they not care about? And that's equally important. So what you want to do is make this notion of caring your filter as you think about selecting content, whether that's information, ideas, data. So when you look at this message here and you put yourself in the shoes of Nada receiving this message, think about what kinds of things she might care about. What might you filter out of this message? And here again, you can just write a few comments in the chat window. Okay, so David said maybe Japan. Now this, this is an interesting email. Um, of course, one of the best ways that we can build relationships online is by thinking about how we can help the people we meet and often that's by connecting them with someone else. Uh, so this is a great opportunity here for Jose to um, kind of build up some, some, some trust with Nada by doing something kind for her, connecting. Uh, but look how he actually starts. He actually starts the message by talking a lot about himself and his history in Japan and the work he did there, blah, 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 blah. So is this going to attract Nada's attention? I'm not really sure. Let's look at this revision, which is what much, much shorter. So you can see that this message gets right to the point by saying that, saying thank you, yes, but then saying, you know, your insights made me think of somebody who might be helpful to you. And then there's just uh, a brief introduction and an offer to make an e-introduction. And notice that the tone here is very conversational as well. So it's not so much, yes, Jessica, like that, clean and simple. That's kind of my tagline. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's not so much what has gone into this message as what has been left out, right? We're thinking about what Nada cares about here. The thing to remember is that if you're thinking about business communication primarily as communication, then, uh, sorry, business writing primarily as conversation, Conversation can actually happen only when the two or more people in the conversation care about something in common. So if uh, you start a conversation and you want to talk about uh, the politics in Southern Italy in the 16th century, and that's not particularly something that's high on my list right now, we're not, we're not going to be engaging for very long, right? Uh, by the same token, if you start a sales conversation and you start, uh, you, you know, you're selling me uh, a new uh, app for my phone and you start talking about all kinds of features that actually are irrelevant to me uh, because I'm only interested in one or two of them, then also we can't really have a conversation because we haven't built that common ground or as the linguists say, they have to call it grounding, this need to have something in common that you both care about. So the second uh, key to really connecting with your audience is to use, of course, the language that resonates with them. And so to understand what that language is, there are all kinds of questions that you can get in the habit of asking. And often when I'm working with people or I'm doing training or coaching, we often spend a lot of time diving deep into some of these questions like, What's their background, educational and professional? Uh, what, what are their personal goals? What are their dreams? Uh, what are they afraid of? 
Uh, often people go straight to that one. Uh, that's a whole other webinar why that's not always the best uh, approach. Uh, but that's an important question, certainly. Uh, what causes are they passionate about? What gets them excited? Um, this is really key. What words or metaphors do they use frequently? Uh, this is an interesting story. When I was briefly running the writing center at St. FX University, I went around to faculty from uh, various departments and was just trying to get to know people so that I could understand the writing needs of their students, whom I would be helping with their essays and reports. And it was so interesting to me because as I went from department to department, I could hear in the language the professor was using their discipline uh, and sometimes in their thought patterns as well. So for instance, I met with this fellow with, uh, who was a mathematician and his conversation was peppered with words like, well, this just doesn't add up. Or yes, I think the sum of this, these ideas is this, right? Really, he, he was almost, you could see that this man lives in the language of mathematical formulae. Um, and by the same token, I spent some time with a biologist who demonstrated to me some groups he had set up for students on LinkedIn, and they were the most organized groups and subgroups and so on. And after speaking to him for just a few minutes, I thought, oh man, this guy, Things in taxonomies, you know, it was like genus, species, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a biologist, I don't know how the taxonomy works, but that was how his mind works. So you really, in order to find the language that resonates, you want to know what's going on with them personally, you want to know what their whole, um, as researchers say, thought world is, so you can tune into that. Because when we're talking about uh, language that resonates, we're not just talking about language people can understand, right? Most of us uh, actually operate in many different language zones, we might say. Um, so for instance, if you look at the woman here in this picture, um, how many different languages, and we might think of languages in, in terms of um, I guess, linguistics, but also in, in terms of occupation. How many different languages, uh, so linguistic and professional, do you think she might speak? Okay, thanks, Drella. So Drella says, so she's going to speak medical language. Alexandria is counting up the languages and she's at three, Amy's already at two. Yeah, so medical, um, she may also maybe speak uh, a language like Arabic. We, we don't know from her attire, that's just a guess. Um, she could also speak a technical, like technology language if her job involves a lot of technology. She may have a lot of access to technology jargon. And, you know, there are maybe other languages. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I meet so many people who start off with a degree in one discipline and end up somewhere, something com somewhere completely different. So, you know, maybe she has a background in history or Russian literature or something. So that could be another language that she speaks. And, oh, that's a very uh, interesting comment as well. Alexandria, the notion of uh, female understanding or knowledge. Oh, one of my favorite books that I read early on as a professor, it's a book called Women's Ways of Knowing. Yeah, very interesting. So yeah, gender uh, shapes language in a lot of ways as well. Okay, so how do we really tune in so that we uh, can get our audience to resonate with what we're saying? This is, this is really how you thicken up your language when you learn or you're writing when you learn to do this. So resonate, remember, means to actually cause something to vibrate at the same frequency. So it's been a long time since I used a tuning fork. So I actually had to check with my husband, who's a musician, to ask him how one of these devices work. Because of course we don't see them very much anymore. Everything's electronic now when we go to tune an instrument. Uh, but the way a tuning fork works is you, you would strike it and initially the tuning fork would make no sound. Uh, but then what you do is you stand the tuning fork up on a, on a table, let's say, and it would cause the table to then resonate. And that's where we would get the pitch that we would tune an instrument to, 
I, I think it's actually really interesting that this is a device my 19 year old daughter wouldn't recognize because in so many ways, when we think of all our electronic devices and the way we're communicating these days, uh, we have forgotten, I think, in many ways, how to do, how, how resonance really works in communication. So what is language that truly resonates? So again, we think of that woman we just saw on the slide. If we're looking for language that will resonate with her, we want language that feels intuitive to her. Uh, language that generates an emotional response, language that creates a strong sense of common ground and sounds authentic and conversational. I've put conversational in bold. I probably should have double underlined it as well. I think the thing to remember is often the language that feels intuitive to us, yes, could be our professional language. That's always there and that's a good way to create common ground, but it could also go much deeper than that. Um, for instance, I grew up the daughter of an Air Force pilot. Actually, if, if, if you're familiar with um, the uh, museum that's just across from the airport exit, there's a, a F-101 there. My dad actually flew that airplane there. It was the last flight from the squadron in northern New Brunswick where he was based. So that means that there's a lot of language about flight and aviation that's actually very intuitive to me. Um, the other thing is that I am very much a visual person. I would describe myself as a visionary. And it, it, especially if you're familiar with uh, the book Rocket Fuel, where it talks about visionaries and integrators. So I'm much more on the visionary side. So that means that my language that's intuitive to me is very visual. So I tend to use a, a lot of phrases like I see, or hmm, I can picture that, or I can't envision that, or I can't imagine that, right? Whereas uh, someone else might not use that, that same kind of language. So when you uh, are trying to use writing to really connect with your audience, this is the kind, uh, this is the level of attention that you need to bring to your audience uh, so that you understand how to really tune into them. And a great way to do that, of course, is to pay really close attention when you have the chance to meet with them on Zoom or phone or in person maybe, uh, but also to actually look at what they write. You know, look at what they write in emails to you or reports to you, look at how their company presents themselves and annual reports and so on. Those are all great clues that you can use to figure out how to create resonance. So here's an example of an email that I would say is not likely to cause much resonance, uh, largely because it comes across as rather stiff. It's not conversational. I'm just gonna give you a moment to look at that and think about what you would change. And then I'm going to show you a possible revision. So here's a revision. Um, what do you notice about this? What differences strike you in the revision? Jessica says it sounds friendly. Chrissy says it even sounds excited, thoughtful and considerate leads with a thank you. So that's part of probably coming across as considerate, Jeff, yeah. And it's much more specific, right? If you want your audience to lean into you, you have to lean into them. That means customizing each message you send. And sometimes people say, oh, I don't have time for that. It doesn't mean that we don't have certain structures or even certain templates that we might start with as a beginning. Um, but if you want to create that personal connection, you have to get personal. And what I have always found and, and what my students have repeatedly told me and clients over the years is that when you take the effort to make it personal, uh, to make it human, um, it, it, to make it so that it's about the person you're writing to, it's not self-serving, as Alexandria said, then you will find you get a much better response, a better response rate, and people are much likely to say yes to you. 
So what are some key elements of a conversational voice? Well, here's my challenge to you as I list these out. Is there one of these that maybe you could try applying today? Because I know you're all going to write at least an email today. Uh, everyday language. So similar to what you'd use in a face-to-face -face business conversation. Short, simple sentences, um, even occasional jargon or slang, if it's going to resonate with your audience. Sometimes breaking some grammar rules um, and using informal punctuation. And finally, contractions. I have had battles with people uh, over whether or not contractions were, were appropriate. And sometimes they are not appropriate, maybe in a very formal government uh, report, the context may not warrant it. The conventions would not support the use of contractions. But whenever I can, I sneak contractions in because guess what? That's how I talk. That's how I talk in, in everyday life. And the closer my writing can talk to, uh, Yes, the closer my writing can actually sound like talk, can sound like speech, then the more authentic it seems, the easier it is for people to see that Dawn is the same person in writing as she is in person, and that creates trust. Okay. The thing to remember is that in a free-flowing conversation, there is that resonance happening, right? Because nobody's stopping to have to maybe translate, right? Oh, what, you know, I think what you're trying to say is, right? Um, well, sometimes that does happen in conversation, but for the most part, if we're actually engaged in a conversation, we've found some language in common that we can, we can use and we don't have to stop and look it up in a dictionary. So ultimately, uh, this is all you can see about building trust. And I just wanted to give you some quick pointers on this and then move on to showing you that model of how you can actually uh, create uh, an email to request a discovery conversation, because I think that will be very useful to you in terms of building online relationships. Okay, so here's the big uh, thing that you want to remember when you're thinking about writing that there's often a kind of a mundane purpose or an informational purpose. So you're writing a progress report, the purpose might be, yeah, I need to give the client a status update. But then there are often bigger purposes which tend to be relational, okay? Uh, so if you're writing a progress report, you may, oh, sorry, also want to be reassuring the client in some way. You may want to impress them in some way. Uh, and maybe your big goal is to create a long-term relationship. So you turn this particular person into a raving fan, or if they're a client, maybe you turn them into a long-term client, right? So you always want to be thinking about that bigger relational purpose, right? So if you look at these two reports here, and these slides will be available to you afterwards if you like them. So you can look at these in more depth. Um, but again, I'm just going to ask you that question. What do you notice in terms of differences? So the one on the right is, is positive in, in, a, in, in set, I think that word positive is really key. So not only is the glass presented as kind of a half full here, but uh, it's also positive in that it's very accessible. So it's very easy for the reader to see, which creates a sense that you as the writer are organized and considerate and very competent. Um, uh, as uh, Jeff says, there's a clear breakdown of information. Um, it's visually appealing. Okay, so you know there. You know, just as we we kind of judge people in person by their appearance, we also do judge writing by its appearance. And we look at somebody and say, "Oh, are they the kind of person that looks approachable? Uh, uh, you know, is this going to be somebody I want to kind of deal with?" And we make those same judgments in writing. So again, in terms of thickening up your writing and communicating more of who you are, think about how you want to come across and how you can use things like organization, uh, design, positive language, and so on. Um, 
The other thing you want to think about in terms of building trust is you want to think about one goal at a time for your writing. So this is a, a big thing I see happening with prospecting emails or any kind of like initial sales email to a potential distributor or partner. Often what happens is uh, the, the tendency is, oh my goodness, this person's going to open the email. So therefore I've got their attention for a split second and I'm just going to throw at them everything they possibly could want to know about me and my organization. And that's a mistake because that's not thinking conversationally, right? If I come up to you in a networking event and say, hi, how are you? I'm Don, blah, 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 and you don't get a word in edgewise, you're not going to want to engage in conversation with me, even if I eventually stop talking. So that's the impact of one of those kind of tell all emails. So what you really want to be thinking about with each document you create, each message you send, even each piece of collateral you create, is what's the next conversation? Because remember, the writing is just part of a broader conversation. So, you know, you think about um, some of the ways, you know, a typical document might lead to a conversation. So if it's a report, well, are you going to discuss it? Are you going to present it? Are you going to analyze it together? Now, if you're preventing a proposal, um, is the conversation going to be about getting feedback, about getting further input, about exploring additional options, about brainstorming other possibilities, and so on. So really think about with one, with one document, what, you know, we tend to think, oh, this is a product, we've shipped it, right? As Seth Godin would say, it's, it's shipped. Um, but we, we want to think instead, really, how does this continue the conversation or maybe start the conversation? All right, well, as promised, I want to get now, I want to share with you the template um, for uh, an effective email to secure a discovery conversation. So a prospecting email, I'm calling this. So as we go into this, I'd like you to think in your mind about a key contact right now somebody you would like to connect with. Could be an influencer on LinkedIn, could be somebody you'd like to approach as a mentor, could be somebody you're trying to get to know as a client. Okay, do you have that person in your mind? Okay, all right. Now, I want you to Think about some of the hurdles that you have to overcome in order to get that person to say yes to you. So some common challenges in convincing somebody to meet with us the first time would include, and I'm going to invite you to add to this list actually, so please I'll be watching the chat window if you can think of other challenges, we'll add them to the list. Um, a lack of familiarity with the writer. Maybe no clear sense of purpose for the conversation. So maybe you're asking somebody for a conversation, but they don't have any sense of actually what's in it for me. Uh, what we call the with them factor. And finally, maybe there's a weak sense of urgency. Why should I talk to you today and not, you know, three months from now? Okay. Again, watching the chat to see if you have any other challenges that you can think of that typically stand between, you know, you and getting that yes to a conversation. So the first thing you wanna do is, um, as you get ready to write your email, really think about how much you know about that person uh, and about the languages they speak, right? So what do they care about? What language will resonate with them? And there are a whole slew of questions you can ask. Um, you know, kind of standard questions just in terms of what we call, might call demographic characteristics, you know, their name, age, ethnicity, work history, and so on. But then you also want to think about things like communication style, what their priorities are in their role, um, what biases they maybe bring to the subject. And this is really, really, really critical. Values. Uh, values are those principles that we cherish and that we won't 
by John. And that means that values tend to drive our behavior. Uh, so if you can really tap into the values of your reader, that's where you start to create that kind of resonance. And often learning about their values will also point you to language you should use. So what you want to do before you even start writing this email uh, is become an online detective, right? So wherever you can find information about them, do that. Um, and uh, not only about them, but about their organization as well. Okay, now as you sit down to write your email, there are, I would suggest, seven questions that your reader wants to know when they get that email. So when you ask for the discovery conversation, these are the questions uh, that the reader wants to know before they say yes. They wanna know, who are you? Why should I care about what you have to say? Remember, a conversation starts when two people care about the same thing. Why do you want to meet? What's the purpose? What will I get from the meeting? That's that what's in it for me with them. What are your expectations for the meeting? So critical to set that so that people know, for instance, you know, is this just to get acquainted for some, uh, because you have common interests or is this a sales call? If it's not a sales call, you know, you, people could still be wondering with a discovery call, you can try to sell me something at the end, you slip that in there. Um, why should I make time for this meeting now? Where's the urgency? And finally, how do I reply to you? Or how do I set up the meeting? Okay, so here's an example then of, um, an email that more or less follows that model, you might be able to find ways to improve it. As I say, I learn everything every time I do a webinar. Um, but I'm really curious to know uh, whether there's, whether there's, as you read through this, whether there's one of those seven questions that maybe you could be doing a better job answering. So have a read through this, and then I'm going to ask you to respond in the chat. Is there one of those seven questions that you could do a better job of answering? So I'm going to take you back to those uh, seven questions here. Okay. Uh, and I want you to really think about that key contact whom you want to connect with and think about how will you answer these seven questions. And what I would like to know is, again, which of these seven questions do you feel like you need to maybe work harder on or focus on more. The second one, yeah, why should I care about what you have to say? Thanks, Amy. Bonnie says all. And, you know, and so, thanks for that, Bonnie. Um, sometimes, uh, I would say quite often when I start working with people on this kind of get to know your audience piece, it can seem a little bit overwhelming. Uh, and so I always say, don't try to eat the elephant all at once. Uh, you know, maybe just pick one thing that you're going to work on this week. And then next week, pick another thing. <laughs> uh, build up bit by bit. Um, there's, a, there's a great book that I wrote about actually in a, in a blog before Christmas. Um, it's called Feel Better in Five. I don't know if you put your hand up if you've read it. It's it written by a, a doctor out of the UK. And his theory is that, you know, basically you can get fit mentally, 
psychologically, emotionally, and physically, just it, it being very consistent with doing very, very little uh, things to improve your health every day, right? So it might be journaling for five minutes. You don't have to write a novel every morning, you know, just journal for five minutes, or it might be just doing, you know, 25 push-ups, uh, I wish. Uh, so I, I think it's very similar when you're trying to make any kind of change, including change in your writing habits, right? Just pick one thing. Uh, I get lost with the real purpose of the meeting. So number three, okay, thanks for that, Thelana. Uh, so yeah, so let's go back to that sample and see how those questions about uh, caring about the meeting and the purpose of the meeting are addressed here. So this is basically kind of a get to know you uh, request, isn't it? Um, but notice that right away, interest is created because there's a name mentioned. So when you drop someone's name, you're actually doing more than name dropping. You're creating common ground. Uh, supposedly, you know, Susan is a person they both know and care about. So again, what do people care about? Well, I, I probably care about Susan. And so if Susan says that we should speak, well, there must be something to this. Um, and then notice that he describes briefly what he does and then says he's eager to connect with other professionals who work in the retail innovation space. It looks like we're serving a similar client base. I'd be interested to learn more about your company and the kinds of solutions you provide. So purpose of this meeting um, in some ways seems very self-centered for Jason, right? Like I'm new here, I want you to give me the lay of the land, but he doesn't really frame it that way. So part of what this recipient can get out of the meeting is actually um, a sense of being a helper, right? And being a little bit of an authority, right? Um, most people actually really like to be asked for advice. If I ask you for advice, if I ask you for your opinion, um, then that means that I'm positioning you as a kind of expert, right? And so that is actually very gratifying to most people. So that could be the with him here, right? And the, and the purpose of the meeting here is not explicitly set out to do so, to say, you know, here's our agenda for the meeting would actually be contrary to the tone and the intent. But the purpose is clearly to maybe share some common knowledge and experience. So I think implicit in this request is, is also the fact that uh, Raina might find it interesting to hear from Jason because he does have 12 years experience uh, working in a similar field. So there's that with him as well. Yeah. So I hope that that helps. Um, as I say, keeping those seven questions in mind, I find is very, very helpful because if you think about it as engagement, as you think about it as conversation, then it's not about what you want to say. It's about what that other person, how that other person is reacting to and interacting with your text. All right, so th that's the uh, body of our conversation. So we do have time left for Q and A. Um, if you do want a copy of the slide deck, I'm uh, happy to share it with you. So I've, I've given my email there uh, and you don't have to send me a long email. You can just put in the subject line HCC slides and I will send them off to you. So Patty, I guess over to you for any questions that we have. Hi everybody, I'm back again. So there was a question in, oh, I thought there was a question, it was answered, okay. Yes, so Dawn, we have a couple of questions that have been submitted to us ahead of time. The first one being, can you tell meaningful stories over social media? That's a big one. <laughs> It is a big one. Yeah. Uh, I would say absolutely. Absolutely. You can. Um, and I guess I would really encourage the person who submitted that to maybe uh, elaborate on it a little bit in the chat if they'd like as, as to maybe what they would see the obstacles 
a being to telling a meaningful story or what they would see as the opposite of meaningful story. Um, I think often with social media, it's very challenging because we are consciously presenting an image of ourself, right? And so there's kind of the self we want people to see, and then there's the real self. Um, I know that um, Anita Kirkbride, uh, who's a, a local social media expert, talks a lot about showing your flawsome self, feel it, flaw some not awesome and I think she's on to something uh, but yeah. then of course you go you know you then you have people go to the other extreme and they kind of fall into this confessional mode where you know they're always kind of in a cheeky way pulling themselves down and so that becomes a little bit of a shtick right um I think the thing to remember to, to me about social media is um ultimately what is your aim on social media social media my understanding is is supposed to be social it's supposed to be about connecting so i think when you are vulnerable without using that vulnerability to manipulate yes you can definitely be authentic and and share real stories um when you're on social media you, you want to still have a, a purpose, you know, people have limited attention. So you want to make sure that your story is structured in a certain way and contains the elements of a story, which sometimes people forget about. Um, yeah. But it's definitely possible to, to balance that vulnerability with authenticity and yet, um, uh, uh, you know, a professional presence. Um, Brene Brown, that would be my bottom line on that. Brene Brown. She's great. Yeah. Definitely. Great question. Another question for you is, since everything, today's environment is virtual, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, and are digital relationships as strong as face-to-face? -face? Mm -hmm. These are tough questions for you today. They are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I have to say, I have to say, you know, it depends what you mean by digital relationships. And again, thinking about the difference between an exchange of information, uh, something that's transactional, and then something that actually becomes a deeper relationship. So can you have a relationship with somebody just by exchanging LinkedIn messages? Mm, I don't think so. Um, but can you develop a relationship with somebody uh, through a long email thread? You know, I think um, I started off as a professor of Victorian literature. And so in uh, Victorian England, uh, one of the most celebrated couples uh, was the Brownings, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning. They were celebrities because poets were celebrities back then instead of you know, rock stars. Um, and uh, they, did, they had this long courtship that was in, entirely letters for a long, long time. And obviously they developed that relationship through writing. And I think the same thing can happen to some extent through email. Now, ultimately, we want to hear the voice. We want to have the connection yeah. with Zoom. But uh, definitely um, email can lead to some deep relationship building. Okay, great. I have one more question for you because I think we're, we're running on time. Is there anyone in the audience? There we go. We have a question from Thana mm -hmm. in the chat box. Strategy for communicating with potential clients or partners online, prospecting clients with the same strategy. Uh, if you're referring Thana to the email model that I used, uh, yes. Yes, I would say that that same model works very well. Anytime you're trying to get that initial conversation, it's very much about um, finding out what they care about, making that common ground, um, establishing trust by talking about who you are um, and showing them what they'll get out of the conversation. So it's very much the same kind of method. Okay, one more question for you. This one's hard. Another hard one for you, Don. Okay. <laughs> Do you believe the art of writing will come back? Oh, so many people much? use shorthands because we're, we're using shorthand, we're using emoticons, we're using all of these things now. 
Um, will writing come back and will it have as much meaning as it did back in the Victorian times? Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, I think that, that writing you know, never left, it's just changing. And so for me, one of the biggest uh, trends uh, and one of the things that I work on a lot with, with folks when I'm coaching them is the trend toward visual communication. So often, I mean, my specialty obviously is the written language. I mean, that's, that's what my PhD was in, you know, English literature. So obviously I have a, a, a deep love and knowledge of the text, but increasingly I don't talk about kind of what I create for clients if, I, if I'm authoring as writing. Um, it's copy or it's, um, it's a message, right? Because it is very much visual and text. So I, I just think, uh, I don't think that our writing is getting less artful or less sophisticated. I just think that it's morphing. Okay. okay. Anyone else have a question from the audience? We've had, uh, you know, we've got 35 people on the call, on the webinar, which is great. If no, I have, I have a whole list of, oh, we have a Q&A. Here we are, okay. So we have someone in the, in the Q&A box. I struggle with being an introvert. I'm better in writing. However, getting the meeting is sometimes tough as owners and buyers seem to only want samples. Hmm. And I believe this is someone who works in the retail sector, if that's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I'm wondering if this is maybe, is this the case for your new business? Um, maybe because that can always be. Yes, challenged. so they're in retail and they're new. And then you, yeah, yeah. So I guess one of the things you can think about in your messaging is how can you provide a sample of the value you are providing? Um, so, and that's where I think it really, it really comes down to thinking about what your real value proposition is. So whatever you are selling, the value doesn't reside just in that object in its physical dimensions right um so it it's it's the you know strength of your brand is basically the emotional association that people have with it um so i would think about how you can emanate those qualities through your writing and are there ways that you can maybe illustrate those that are non uh, physical. And of course, sometimes if you're a very, very early stage, um, I'm, I'm doing some entrepreneurship curriculum right now for the university uh, and just did a piece on customer discovery, right? So um, actually using writing as a means to engage with people very early in your business. So you involve them in actually conversations about the design of what you're offering. That can be a very, very powerful way to get your foot in the door and a well-crafted email can open many doors that way. Okay, that's great. Uh, one last quick question. This one's easy for you, Dawn. Okay. What are your thoughts on sending handwritten notes, letters during time of COVID? Oh, well, I think it's safe enough. I mean, people are offering, you know, are, are still taking out library books and, and so on. So I would go right ahead. Um, I always love a handwritten note. I don't send as many as I should because my handwriting <laughs> is terrible. Uh, but they are, of course, a very, a kind of the ultimate way to, to really personalize something. Okay, we have one last question in our Q&A box and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. So this one's from uh, Thana. I have problems organizing, planning and keeping momentum going. Sometimes we lose the real meaning and lose track on what's real purpose of the connection. Emails get lost. Are there any tips that you can offer to keep the momentum in the relationship? Hmm. Again, the, the context, it's a little yeah. 
um, tricky. Uh, I know something that can be helpful and it goes to that kind of lean in uh, thing is um, paying close attention to the, the, the moments in the conversation or the e email exchange um, where there's almost sometimes new language being invented, right? So uh, you and I, Patty, might have a, a discussion uh, about an upcoming events or something or event planning or whatever. And, and we kind of come up with like a little buzzword between us or, or a metaphor that we uh, hang. Oh, for instance, um, somebody, um, this is a bishop uh, recently, I heard him describe different kinds of parishes. And he says, well, there are cat parishes, which say, keep your distance. I don't want to see a bishop. And there are dog parishes and dog parishes say, hi, bishop, come on in. I'm so glad to see you, right? <laughs> So, so now, now that I know that that's kind of a, a key word for him, so then when I, if I were writing him and talking to him about parishes, um, I would not talk about friendly and unfriendly or, you know, aloof and friendly. I, I would talk about cat and dog parishes. So okay. I would watch for those moments in, in the relationship where you kind of start to have a little bit of insider language going on. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we're, we're pretty much out of time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today on our webinar. Uh, it's been very informative. And uh, personally, I am very keen in following up with you, Don, on some communication strategies uh, in my new role here at the Chamber and reaching out to our members. Um, Tomorrow, just as, a, as an update, we have our conversation with the Premier Candidate Ian Rankin, that is another business uh, support services webinar. You can view all of our events on our website. We are here, we are busy, we are engaging, we are supporting small business as we move through the COVID pandemic. <laughs> and um, you can review this recording, will be on our YouTube channel later today. And Again, thank you so much, Dr. Henwood. This is very informative and we hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Enjoy the sunshine. Yes, get out and walk in the sunshine. Yeah, that's great. Take care. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great day.